Wechsel! What's up everyone, I am kicking off 2016 with a much requested video on how to make a time lapse. Now there are lots of different ways to make a time lapse. This isn't necessarily here's the only way to do it. I'm actually gonna show you three different ways that I figured out how to do it for myself. And there's other ways too, so leave those down in the comments section while you're maybe hitting the like button if you enjoyed this video. But let's start off with the three ways that I'm gonna show you today. One is just recording a video and I'm gonna use a standard camcorder for that. Second way is to take pictures with a camera, ideally with an intervalometer, and then the third way is just going to be to use a webcam. So even if you have a laptop with a built-in webcam, you can make a time lapse even if you don't necessarily have a camera. Now before I dive into my three methods, let's start out with three general best practices for shooting a time lapse. Whether you're using my methods or whether you're using your own, you should always, number one, use a tripod or a fixed mount. Your camera should be immobile. It should not move and you should even place that tripod ideally somewhere where it's not likely to get kicked or bumped at all. Because having that static camera is the number one key thing to getting a nice smooth time lapse. Number two is to use the manual settings that your camera has to offer. The camera should not do anything by itself without you telling it to. That means no automatic exposure, no autofocus, uh, no auto white balance. Turn all those auto functions off and adjust everything yourself so you have it set up right when you start the time lapse. That way there will be no shifts or changes as the time lapse progresses. The third thing is to think long term, just generally speaking. While you're setting up your shots, while you're adjusting your camera, is your time lapse just going to take a few minutes? Or is it going to go for a few hours or a few days even? How might the light change over the course if you have the sun coming up and going down? Where will the action take place within the frame that you're setting up? Getting a wider shot is often a better way to go because you can always crop it in later. And then lastly, I would say always, always use an AC adapter if you can to plug into your camera for constant power so you're not relying on a battery. And then have lots and lots of storage available like you know 64 128 gig cards so you can just set it and forget it and not worry about running out of space so moving on to the first way that I make time lapses and that you can easily make time lapses too and that is pretty much to just point and shoot so you set up your camera you hit record you record video and then you bring it into an editing program later, I'm gonna be using Premiere, and you just speed it up to 2,000 or 4,000% or something like that. Um, the pros to this method is that it's pretty easy. You can just point the camera and hit record. Uh, another, another nice thing about it is that um, you won't be waiting for your footage to render out later on as you would with uh, taking a bunch of pictures, and we'll be getting to that in just a second as far as what that means. You can slow down the footage too uh, when you're recording straight video. So you could suddenly slow down to real time and you might even actually have usable audio in there as well. So that gives you a little bit of flexibility for editing in the future. Now there are some cons that go along with this as well. One is that you will have very large file sizes, especially if you're shooting in 4K and especially if you're shooting longer takes. So that makes this kind of impractical for longer time lapses. If you're shooting something that's say an hour or less, you're probably good. But if you want to go three, four, five hours or multiple days, you're, you just, you're not going to have enough space doing that. And scrubbing through footage that's say shot at 1080, 30 frames per second and then sped up 5,000% can be pretty clunky, especially if your system is slower or you don't have really fast storage speed. So that's something to think about if you're worried about the post-production side of it. Some general tips for using this standard method is uh, one, to use it for shorter time lapses. So let's say an hour or less. I often use this method if I'm just shooting a, uh, a build that I know won't take too long. Also consider using a lower frame rate to conserve the disk space. Uh, setting this camera to 24 frames per second rather than say 30 frames per second might use up a little bit of less space and uh, just give you a little bit more room to work with. Method number two for making a time lapse is just to take pictures but you need to take lots of pictures and they need to be evenly regulated. For that, you need something called an intervalometer. Newer cameras like my Panasonic uh, Lumix LX100, as well as my GH4 that I'm using to film this right now, have an intervalometer built into the software. And in fact, even my older camera, the 5D Mark II, didn't have one built in, but I was able to get a third party kind of firmware add-on called the Magic Lantern that allowed me to do it. Um, some cameras have an external device that you can purchase to do it, but um, for today, I'm just gonna be uh, using my built-in feature right here, which is really nice to have. So if you're looking for a camera, 
and you want to do this, then definitely look for one that has a built-in intervalometer. That will uh, allow you to set the camera to take a picture every, say, one to five seconds, and you can make it longer or shorter than that. Generally speaking, when I'm shooting, I usually go for about one every, say, three seconds, maybe four seconds. If you're shooting something that will take longer, like multiple days, or you're doing photography of uh, plants growing or something like that, consider doing a much longer interval, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, or more. And here's a quick look at how I set up the intervalometer on the GH4. Time-lapse mode for the GH4 is pretty simple. Just make sure on this main dial you're set to full manual mode, not the manual video mode, although manual video mode is awesome. Then over here on this little jog dial, you gotta switch it all the way over to this guy, um, which is the opposite side from that one, which is take a single picture, and then there's burst mode and a couple more. So pull all the way over to that, and you, know, you might notice down here, it'll give you the start time-lapse option. Uh, if you hit the menu button, you can go in and adjust some of the time-lapse functions, such as when it starts, and how long the interval is between shots I have it set to three seconds and how many images it should take before it stops which I usually set to the max which is 9999. To so have it set here you just take a picture and then it will continue taking pictures every three seconds until it hits 9999 or it runs out of space on the memory card. So as long as you can take a picture every so often, then you can make a time lapse with it, which means that a smartphone is another viable option for something like this. You can get an app, set up your smartphone with uh, some kind of rig to hold it in place, and then go that route. I'm not going to be diving into that for this video, but um, it's another option if you guys want to look into it. The pros for this method are that, in my opinion, it provides the best end result, uh, the best quality and uh, just the sharpest image, as long as you took good pictures that were in focus, of course. The final rendered time-lapse is also gonna be very high in quality, but very small in file size relative to, say, a single long video that you record all at once, or even all of the individual pictures that you originally capture, because there can be a big difference between the size of the pictures and the size of a rendered video. My method results in a 4K video at the end of it, uh, for at least for this method, and that's really great as well for panning and zooming. So if I'm doing a 1080 video, but I have a 4K image, then I can take that 1080 frame and move it around. There are some cons to this method that you should keep in mind though. One is gonna be that importing and rendering a time-lapse with thousands and thousands of photos can take a really long time. So you might need a higher end system or you might just need a lot of patience to go along with that. The raw images that uh, you take when you're doing thousands of photos this way can also take up a lot of space. And I've had some projects that had 30 to 50 gigs just in raw images for a time lapse. The nice thing about that though, is that after you've rendered all those photos into a single video file, then you can delete all the photos and just keep the file and you're generally speaking okay. The final thing you might consider is that uh, your shutter count is gonna go way up on the camera that you use. So my old 5D Mark II that I use this for, I was a little concerned that the shutter count was getting really, really high on that. It can also wear out that mechanism. Generally speaking, not an issue because most cameras can take tens of thousands of photos without a problem, but just something to point out. Some general tips for this method are that you will definitely, definitely want to use an AC adapter. Um, this one is for this, but I have AC adapters that go uh, to these cameras as well. And you will want a memory card that has lots of space. Again, you, with the time lapse, you wanna just set it up, hit go, and then not really worry about it for quite a while. You should also give yourself a bit of extra time to render these time lapses, because I've definitely been in a situation where I'm like, I wanna edit this video right now, and then I'm like, oh, I need to wait like, I don't know, an hour or two, depending on how diligent I am about refreshing things, just to import all the stuff and then render it. And again, I'll show you in just a minute how long that actually takes. Uh, the third thing is that you should always remember to resize your photos after you add them into your Premiere timeline. And again, I'll show you that in just a second. My third method is the webcam method. And this method can be set up with just a simple laptop, a webcam, and the software. Um, the software I'm gonna be using is called Chronolapse. I found this a while back and it's worked great for me, so I have continued to use it. Just remember to run it as administrator. Um, the webcam I'm using today is the Logitech C920, although if you have a laptop with a built-in webcam, you can use that just as well. So again, you don't really need to necessarily have a camera in order to use this method. Uh, once you've launched the software, you can select your webcam that's plugged in hopefully, and uh, choose the resolution and the frame rate that you want it to capture at. Definitely use the preview function to uh, set up your shot and make sure you're capturing everything properly and make sure it looks good and that kind of thing. Uh, and then from there, you can just simply enter a number of seconds that will elapse between the time that it captures each image. The pros of using this method are that it uh, has a minimal hardware investment. So if you just have a laptop, that's all you really need. And a webcam, of course. 
or PC and webcam. Uh, also, you can use this method to capture, say, your desktop that you're working on. Uh, so if you do a lot of Photoshop work or something like that and you wanna do a time lapse of it, you can use that. Uh, you could even connect like a real camera to this uh, using a capture card. Of course, you would have to pay for a capture card and capture straight from that, uh, which is something I've considered doing, but I haven't quite done yet. Small USB webcams like the Logitech C920 are also very easy to position in interesting places since they're pretty small and uh, I have a USB extension that I can use to position this like up above my head for those kind of cool top-down shots that I get while I'm building computers. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that you can capture straight to an external SSD, which is a, what I do with the laptop I have it connected to. That way I can just take that SSD, connect it to my editing system, and it's really fast. I can render straight off of that or I can just copy the uh, images very, very quickly. The cons to this method, well, the major number one con is just that you're gonna get webcam image quality. The resolution is not gonna be as good as a real camera. So my webcam time lapses don't typically look as sharp and clean as the ones I do with normal cameras. Also, depending on the resolution and the frame rate that you're capturing at, with this software at least, I have found that image tearing can occur at certain times, although when it's sped up really fast, it's really not too noticeable. Some general tips would be to first always make sure you go in and use the webcam software, in this case it's Logitech software, to turn off any of the automatic functions that it might have, like autofocus, auto white balance, and auto exposure, face tracking, that kind of thing. You don't want it doing any of that. Uh, also, you can use a lower, you set it to a lower resol resolution and then hit preview and you can use that to frame up your shot, but then close that and go back out and then choose one of the highest resolutions possible because um, that's just going to get you the best image quality and shrinking it down will improve the shar sharpness with it just a little bit. Remember that webcams can often capture single images at a much higher resolution than they're rated for video. So even though this uh, does 1080 video, it actually captures it something closer to 2K. I forget exactly what it is. So your next question would probably be, well, now that I've captured my video or my thousands of pictures, how do I then take that and transform it into a nice clean looking time lapse? Well, I'm going to be using Adobe Premiere and I will show you how to do that right now. And here's the promise to creating a time lapse in Adobe Premiere tutorial. I'm using Premiere 6.0, but uh, it should be roughly the same for Creative Cloud. Uh, I am going to first create a new project with my 4K preset that I already have. You can make one for yourself as well. I'm going to then first, before I do anything, go to Preferences and then General and then change my still image default duration to two frames. This is very important. Uh, next up, I'm going to make a new bin and then go ahead and grab all my pictures and import them. Now you will have to wait for a little while because depending on how many pictures you're importing, depending on your system and depending on your storage configuration, this can take quite a while. For this reason, I always make a backup and then copy all my pictures to a couple RAID 0 SSDs, which generally speeds things up. After the import finishes, I'm gonna grab all the images and drag them over to the timeline. Then I'm gonna zoom all the way in so I can see the very first images, and then I'm going to go and resize it to match the frame size. Usually they're a bit larger than 4K, so shrink them down usually to 84, 86%. Copy that motion effect that you just made, and then select all the rest of the pictures on the timeline, and then paste the motion effect onto them. This will resize every image image on the timeline. And now you're ready to export your crispy 4K time-lapse. Just remember to use proper export settings for 4K video and you can go ahead and uncheck that audio box. And that is all for this video, guys. If you happen to learn a little something today, then don't forget to hit the like button down there and feel free to comment below if you used any of these methods to make your own time-lapse or if you know other fancy secret techniques that I don't know about, then share them down there too. The best way to help me out and support my channel though is to use my Amazon link. That's also down there in the video description. Just click it and then shop and check out and that helps me a lot. Uh, you can also visit my store at store.paulshardware.net where you can find Paul's Hardware shirts uh, as well as mugs and pint glasses. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Happy 2016 everyone and as always, thank you for watching.